thanks for the very warm welcome. It's much appreciated. And thanks to you all for being here. Have you ever looked at the stars at night? Have you ever been far away from city lights, stood somewhere outside of the city, and just looked at the bright sky above you? Have you ever felt the chill of the night and soon forgotten how cold it was because you just couldn't stop looking at all these stars? And have you ever started wondering if there's maybe something more beyond them, if there's maybe even life somewhere out there? What we see in our night skies is just this very tiny fraction of our galaxy. And only imagining our galaxy or the galaxies outside of our own is almost impossible for us. We admire the stars we see, and we're often unaware that there's so much more beyond them. This is a talk about nothing. Nothing, an abstraction, an impossibility. If nothing actually existed, it wouldn't be nothing. For centuries, scientists have dedicated themselves to nothing. Nothing, or what we've long taken to be nothing, has become a lens through which can, we can explore the universe around us and understand what it's like to be human. Nothing is the basis of our existence. Take maths, for example. In the first place, huge parts of, parts of maths were based on geometrical or physical realities. And while the first evidence of counting stretches back 5,000 years, it took a lot of time and abstract thinking until the first versions of nothing appeared in maths around 2400 BC. Today, maths now has two versions of nothing. The first version of nothing is an empty set, like a basket. If there's nothing in it, the basket is analogous to an empty set. Nothing describes the basket. The second version of nothing in maths is zero, the number. If I have no apples in my basket, then I have zero apples. Zero describes the number of elements or apples that are in the basket or set. And zero, the number, is powerful. If not handled with care, it can bring the entire number system crashing down. You just need to multiply any number by zero, and it will collapse down to zero. And we don't even want to walk into what happens when you divide a number by zero. Today, mathematics is unthinkable without nothing and zero. They both have changed entirely what we can calculate and how far we can go with our numbers. Physicists like Isaac Newton or Albert Einstein have spent many, many years trying to figure out a nothing as well. Their main question was, is empty space, like outside the Earth's atmosphere, really empty? But it was not until 1998 that astronomers discovered empty space is not empty. It's permeated by dark energy, the energy that would be left after removing all galaxies, all stars, and all particles from the universe, and that accounts for more than 70% of the universe's mass. Dark energy is also responsible for accelerating the expansion rate of the universe. Another empty space that physicists have looked into is the vacuum. Even if there is a vacuum in a box, the box is still not empty. The box, which seems to contain nothing visible for our eyes, still contains an irreducible, hard-to-measure electric field inside it. A vacuum is never empty. It always contains an infinite amount of energy. This is an aerial graphics of the world's largest scientific machine and particle collider, particle accelerator, sorry, the Large Hadron Collider, or LHC. It's located near Geneva, Switzerland, and it's a 27 kilometer long ring of more than 1,600 superconducting magnets, which are up to 15 meters long. The prime goal of LHC, of which you can see one tiny part here, is to find evidence for the Higgs particle. Quite much like dark energy, the Higgs particle is believed to permeate empty space. In fact, at LHC, scientists are trying to find a piece of nothing. In order to find it, the LHC accelerates particles to high speed and tries to make them collide in an ultra-high vacuum. That's a task very much like firing two needles 10 kilometers apart with such precision that they meet halfway. In 2012, 
a particle with characteristics quite similar to the Higgs particle was found. But it's still not clear if it was the Higgs, if it wasn't, or if various versions of the Higgs exist. No matter what, this nothing is going to touch basics of what we know about the universe. Let's take another look at the nothing which we use every day. Computers in general are largely a collection of electronic switches that operate in binary mode. They only know off and on or zero and one. The first electronic computers used vacuum tubes as switches, which were super inefficient and made computers huge. The famous ENIAC, which stands for Electronic Numerical Integrator and Computer, weighed 27 tons, also because it contained more than 17,000 vacuum tubes and it took up almost 170 square meters of space. But everything changed in 1947 when the first working transistor was unveiled. The principle that the transistor is based on is quite simple. When electrons get kicked into action by light and are under the influence of chemical elements, they change places to fill holes in their electron structure. They start moving because they need to go where there's nothing before. Transistors now power our computers, smartphones, printers, and other digital devices. In the computer chip, the transistors are part of an integrated circuit, or microchip. If you buy a new laptop these days, you'll get a microchip with around 1.3 billion transistors on a chip the size of a fingernail. And it's still based on electrons trying to switch into where there was nothing before. Nothing is what keeps our digital age running. There's so much more to our realities than we perceive with our senses. What often seems like nothing is the basis of why we are, who we are, and what we do. Same goes for the tech industry. Our computers run on zeros and ones, but our lives as humans are far more complex than that. There's so much more going on in tech than we sometimes realize, and much more to discover beyond our own horizons. This talk aims to raise awareness for what is going on, because they, these, these, these things which we sometimes cannot perceive are amongst the most powerful source, forces in this industry, and they affect our daily lives. And it will have huge impact on the future of this industry, including every one of us, you and me. When we as people in tech today want to understand what's beyond our own perceptions, there are a few things we can learn and skills in which we can train ourselves to become aware of nothings. We live in a society where, in which power is unevenly distributed. Some groups of people can exist in the society with ease, gain influence, and are accepted without scrutiny or suspicion, which gives them advantages relative to other groups. This means that they have privilege. Privilege comes from various factors, like gender, race, class, educational, socioeconomic background, ability, appearance, physical or mental health, and many more. Take me, for example. I pass as a cissexual woman, which means that my gender matches the sex I was assigned at birth. Or my perception and experience of my own gender matches the sex I was assigned at birth. I'm also white. I was born into a middle-class family and received education. I'm able-bodied, and my weight and height are within the boundaries of what is socially considered acceptable. And this list is not even exhaustive. This is my privilege, which I recognize and try to act according to. And this means that my privilege also sets limitations for my actions. Many people in tech are fairly privileged as well. In fact, White, able-bodied, cis-heterosexual men have a near monopoly on the power and money that keeps this tech industry machine spinning. Around 80% of engineering staff at major tech firms like Twitter, Google, and Facebook are men. And between 60 and 95% of all their staff are white. The numbers in open source are quite similar. Between 90 and 95% of contributors are men. The numbers of women of color, lesbian, gay, bisexual, transsexual, or intersexual people are still incredibly low. 
Tech is an exclusive space with a high entry barrier for the less privileged ones. That much privilege makes for many nothings in this industry. And I want to be very clear about what I mean when I say nothing in this talk. What is nothing and no problem to many privileged people leads to a constant struggle for others. There are underrepresented, marginalized people in the tech industry who are fighting on a daily basis for their sheer existence here. While, on the other hand, a vast number of people have the privilege not to listen, the privilege not to care, the privilege to ignore, the privilege to do nothing, and the privilege to go on with their lives. This is privilege, the luxury to ignore and not care about the experiences of marginalized people in this industry, a luxury that no member of a minority in tech has. Recognizing and acknowledging our privilege means understanding that privilege comes with responsibility. The responsibility to first become aware of our own privileges we hold. We also need to shut up and listen to the experiences of less privileged people. We need to educate ourselves on the topics in which we hold privilege. We also need to use our own privilege for good. We need to speak up when we see or hear, for example, racism or sexism, stand with less privileged people and amplify their voices. And finally, we need to hold ourselves accountable, listen when people call us out and learn from failing. We can also become allies to less privileged people. Being an ally means being supportive to a marginalized group, and it's a constant, lifelong process. Whatever we do, the responsibility of working through our privilege, listening to others, and acting accordingly is on us, the people who hold it. Every day, we make countless decisions without even realizing it. Each of us faces around 11 million pieces of information at any given moment. Our brains can only process 40 of these, and so they make shortcuts and finally use past knowledge, experiences, and cultural norms to make assumptions. This is called unconscious bias. We all have these biases, and they cause us to misjudge people or situations and they're critical when we're designing products or building software. Let me give you a few examples of unconscious biases which show how they influence our actions every day, even when, by definition, we don't realize them. Candidates for a medical school interviewed on rainy days receive 10% lower ratings than candidates interviewed on sunny days. Job candidates with names that didn't sound stereotypically African-American received 50% more callbacks than those with African-American sounding names. With the exact same resume, candidates with the name John received a 20% higher rating for competence and a $4,000 higher salary than candidates with the name Jennifer. When YouTube launched their video upload ad for iOS, between 5 and 10% of all videos were upside down. But it wasn't users who were shooting videos incorrectly. The application was the problem. It was designed for right-handed users, but phones are usually rotated 100 degrees when shooting videos with the left hand. The team had unconsciously created an app that worked best for their almost exclusively right-handed developer team. Another example is about hardware. Zeynep Tufekci, at this time a scholar of social movements, was in Istanbul at the time of the protests at Gezi Park. She had a smartphone with a camera and tried to document what she saw, including violence like tear gas misuse. But she couldn't. Her hands were too small to lift the phone above her head, hold it steadily, and take a picture. She could not document violations of human rights because her hardware didn't allow her to. This is why diversity in experience, body size, ability, gender, and more aspects is so important. Diversity influences basic questions of equity and accessibility, and these are crucial determinants. They define whether our products are actually usable or not. 
What helps us in combating these unconscious biases we all have is education. We need to identify and understand our own biases and help others understand theirs. We also need to be mindful of subtle cues because it's the little things that sometimes make a big difference. We need to foster awareness for the topic in ourselves and others and, again, need to hold ourselves and others accountable. There's a word that exists in the space between words where nothing is said, and we can discover it by applying a skill we all have, empathy. Empathy is a powerful and useful skill. It helps us feel and understand the emotions, circumstances, thoughts and needs of humans around us and our communication with them. As designers, content creators and developers working on tools which are used by people, we too often don't view the design and code of our software as a complete personal experience. But our users are not single data points or test scenarios. They are humans and as such, they are carrying their past and present pain, joy, their entire life experiences in when they are using what we built. And we do just the same. By all we say and don't say in our software, the wordings and the interactions we built, we're making communication choices that affect the way our users feel and the interactions we'll have with them. As people working on software, empathy is our responsibility, and it's a skill we can practice every day. Empathy allows us to be more supportive of the people we meet. It can help us change our communities and culture into a positive direction can make us happier and helps us understand what's beyond our own horizons. As seen so far, acknowledging our privilege, combating unconscious bias and practicing empathy are keys to uncovering nothing in tech and acting according to our responsibilities. Now let's look at the tech world of today. Coding and software development both result in computers processing zeros and ones. But code is an enormously powerful tool. Language shapes reality, and programming languages can change the realities of people. Just recently, the open source application Be My Eyes launched. It aims to connect non-sighted people with sighted ones. When a non-sighted person is stuck with a certain task, they can ask for somebody to help them. Although not without problematics, Be My Eyes has a great approach to be an empowering tool and will hopefully be able to help many people. What we code can empower people and help them solve their own problems. Code can also create limitations. It can harm and exclude people. Sometimes just very small changes in an interface can have big impact. Let's take a look at some examples. Over the past years, there's been an ongoing discussion about so-called real name policies in social networks, usually meaning legal names. Real name policies were originally introduced in an attempt to reduce the veil behind which online bullying, harassment and stalking can occur. But these anti-pseudonymity policies have consequences. They're actively harming marginalized and endangered people who most heavily rely on pseudonyms like women, LGBT people, people with disabilities, victims of abuse and harassment, activists, whistleblowers, and many more. The cost of these policies to these people can be vast, including harassment, discrimination, actual physical danger, and much more. Instead of protecting people, these policies harm them. People who either choose to use pseudonyms, want to use a name which is not their legal name, or make an entirely different choice, always have to be able to do so. Enforcing real name policies in online spaces is an abuse of power. In some tools, avatars show men by default. If the default or unset avatar on your site reads as a man, you're making an implicit statement that your normal user is a man and everyone else is just an exception. Another limitation is created when you just ignore vast parts of your user base, like Apple that released a health application in which you can track basically anything aside from menstruation. 
Many software rollouts opt users into new features automatically, but they tend to damage users unevenly. Usually the ones who are less technical are most affected, and users from marginalized communities are mo the most likely to be endangered by violations of their privacy. Many people outside the tech industry are aware that their software persistently and pervasively violates their boundaries, but they don't feel they can do anything about it. Also, tools for privacy preservation, like the Tor browser, are still far from being accessible to less technical people. Still commonly used as well are dark UI patterns, user interface design approaches that trick users and manipulate their consent. It is not acceptable that the most privileged and powerful ones <coughs> make the rules for these spaces by writing software that actively endangers those marginalized groups. We have written software that enables harassment and stalking, and we've reached a point where users have to permanently distrust the tools they're using, where they cannot rely on anything, and where they're always at risk of having their personal safety at stake. All of by what we designed and coded. We have established a state in which users' consent is routinely violated, and in which these violations are normalized into invisibility. We need to build accessible products and platforms which value enthusiastic consent, aid users' resistance, and we need to build tools which restore their ability to set and enforce their own boundaries. Chop, 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 ah! What is all this crap? Why is this structure here? Where could this bridge possibly lead? Oh, a sign. This is bridge. This sign doesn't help me much. What a horribly designed street, most inefficient. Good God, what, does, what the hell does this contraption do? I hate reading other people's code. Documentation is one of the most valuable things we do, and it's the backbone of all our applications. Lack of documentation in our projects or outdated incomplete docs create invisible limitations and raise entry barriers for people. And then there's, of course, code commons. <laughs> Take some time here. Um, undocumented, insufficiently commented projects often speak the language of bad planning, bad management, too much stress, and lack of sustainable thinking. And most of all, they speak of lack of awareness. Lack of awareness for the invisible limitations we create. And lack of awareness that not everyone is like us and not everyone has the same experience level that we may have. With all we do, we need to give people everything to be independent. We need to enable people to be in charge themselves. Do you know where the term software patch originally comes from? Like other programming terms, it originated with Mark I computer, which was used in Harvard from early 1944. Small corrections to the program sequence could be done by just patching over portions of the paper tape and re-punching the holes in that section. In this picture, you can see two patches in dark gray on the top. There's tiny patches in software documentation today that can make a bit difference, like this patch. A very small pull request to a library that affected only one word in the entire documentation. It was about removing the male gendered pronoun him and replacing it with this gender neutral, socially unproblematic they. This tiny patch received 227 comments, many of the commenters claiming that they were not interested in small changes like that and that it was an overall trivial minor change. The discussion exploded and ended up with a heated debate and people claiming to leave the community. And this is not the only example. Heated debates about the use of gendered pronouns and wordings have been held across several other projects as well. Male gender documentation is still very often the default. It has three clear issues. First, it assumes that men are the default, which is sexist and wrong. Second, it enforces domination of men. And third, 
it excludes all people who are not male. Tim Chevalier commented this pattern as follows. No one ever seems to say that men's desire to protect the status quo is trivial or unworthy of attention. Triviality only gets used to characterize challenges to the status quo, they wrote. Open source is supposed to be fixing what's broken. Patch is welcome, they say. Now here was a patch, and the patch was too trivial. Defenders of the status quo often say this, while the amount of time and energy that they invest in defending the status quo communicate an entirely different message. Another ongoing issue in the tech industry is the domination of whiteness and the massive racism problem. This one is a pull request in Django stocks and tests, and it's about replacing the so-called master-slave terminology, terms which carry racially charged meanings. This one pull request got merged quickly, but then the storm arose. It received around more than 800 comments, and many of them extremely racist and offensive, and written by white people, while people of color, on the other hand, expressed their appreciation for the change. This industry is still dominated by white men, and they're widely visible everywhere, while other groups and their opinions are erased on a regular basis. In order to make a change, many things will have to happen. And not all of them will be as trivial as the changes of wordings and software documentation, and some of them will be painful. Everything that is in our code, in the documentation and comments, and everything that is not there and just between the lines, all of it speaks its own language. There may be nothing, but it's widely visible. The way we handle our code comments and documentation speaks loud and clear about our projects and communities. In mid-2014, we met with some members of the Hoodie Open Source Project community. We had been working in a distributed team for a long while and wanted to spend some in-person time together again. After some time, we realized that everybody was feeling a lot of pressure in the open source project to get something ready and released. We realized that we had unconsciously established a shipping culture in the project, a culture that was mainly about getting things done, getting things released, and we had lost awareness of too many too relevant things on our way. We had unconsciously lost track of the humans in our project, and it took this get together to find out how many of us were close to burning out. Seth Godin wrote, ship often, ship lousy stuff, but ship often, ship constantly. Jeff Atwood expressed the same as well as Matt Mullenweg and various tech companies. In tech, we have a shipping culture. We are release focused. Work on stuff, get it out quickly, get users to test it, improve and add new features, release quickly again. Quick iterations can be useful, but the mighty culture we've established around shipping is hurtful. We've come to a point where we ship constantly for the wrong reasons. Shipping culture induces enormous pressure on humans. The idea of improving constantly ourselves and our personalities, skills as teams and in the products we build together is extremely capitalist. When we look at the software that has been shipped in the past few years, may it be open source or proprietary software, we more and more often see that it is not improved through constant shipping, rather to the contrary. Various tools, for example, in the database sector, frameworks, runtime environments and more, have become packed with more and more features, but have become full of flaws and sometimes even unusable. The way we ship now is far away from the original idea of getting user fit feedback in quickly and iterating with them. In fact, we're mostly shipping because of our own company internal interests, deadlines, and just because everybody does it and we think it's the right thing to do. But software engineering and computer science are still very young fields. We can't solve problems if we don't allow ourselves time to think about them. This is an imperative ignored by our shipping culture, which values doing more than thinking. Shipping culture also excludes non-coding team members, since non-coding related tasks like design, 
marketing, project management, writing, administration or others, often don't lead to things that can be shipped. It also keeps people from looking beyond their own horizons, from looking into one of the numerous pressure and cultural topics which are going on in tech. Because work on cultural topics, as well as diversity work and being an ally, is nothing that people can ship and earn merit for. Its merit-centered approach even makes shipping culture dangerous. A major point in tackling the shipping culture in the Hoodie Project was that we changed the focus of our weekly team meetings. Instead of presenting what they shipped, everybody was encouraged to talk about themselves, how they were doing, their personal learnings, failures and highlights or lowlights. Fighting shipping culture is an enormous task, but we found out that for this project, the little things can already help to relieve some pressure that we're all feeling. Pete Warden recently wrote, when I'm optimizing code, my intuitions about which parts are slowest is often wildly wrong. So I've learned the hard way that I have to profile the hell out of it before I try to fix anything. It's a core skill for dealing with computers. Our gut feelings often don't work well. So skepticism becomes a habit. What has surprised me is how we leave that habit behind when confronted with evidence about ourselves. Every statistic out there says there's fewer and fewer women getting computer science degrees and working as developers. 41% of women leave careers in technology after 10 years. That's more, twice, more than twice the number of men. The diversity numbers of large companies are laughable. Still, too many of us fail at even acknowledging that there is a problem. We're used to optimizing all we can out of our code, but when confronted with evidence about our industry, we fail at keeping this attitude. Recently, the huge conference, free and open source conference, FOSTEM in Belgium took place. Instead of putting a code of conduct in place to protect their attendees and especially underrepresented groups, they just wrote in their conference brochure, the FOSTEM organizers were surprised to hear that harassment is a common problem at open source conferences around the world. This is tough and this is bitter especially given the huge number of documented incidents at key conferences and in communities over the past decades. Being in this industry and not caring about tech culture is a luxury that's only affordable to those with enough privilege to ignore and too little empathy to care. We hold accuracy so dear when it comes to code and we just don't care when it comes to making our industry a better place. And improving all our ongoing issues is going to take a lot more than writing code. Status in tech is still mainly defined by meritocracy. The illusion that people be judged by their merit only, that those with merit should flow to the top, and that they should be given higher rewards and more opportunities. Although not more than an illusion, meritocracy is highly lucrative. It's an asset in careers and companies. It gets people jobs, races, venture capital, community support, and more. Meritocracy delivers. It delivers for those who are already in power. It delivers for white, cis heterosexual men. As long as these privileged people get to define what merit is, meritocracy will merely reinforce existing power structures. Meritocracy exacerbates the lack of diversity in tech and reinscribes a system of oppression. This illusionary idea that meritocracy is has become a weapon we use to find explanations why tech is still such a homogenous space. All underrepresented groups just didn't earn enough merit to become part in it, it says. It uses victim blaming towards those who aren't allowed to succeed in it. And everything which could potentially hurt existing power structures, like diversity work or activism, is deemed as not merit and therefore dismissible. But there's one more side to meritocracy, which makes it a double-edged sword. With merit comes visibility. And whilst visibility is great for white cis heterosexual men, 
it's enormously dangerous for the rest of us. For us, with visibility comes harassment, stalking, threats, emotional and sometimes physical violence. Doing anything that might bring attention always comes with risk. On top of that, er earning merit, like through open source contributions, often requires a lot of spare time, which many marginalized people just don't have. As long as merit earned is still a core value for relevance of people's voices and one of the main factors we look for in hiring, we won't be solving any of tech's and ongoing problems. Meritocracy even enforces abuse. Just one example is Linus Torvalds, idol and hero of hacker and nerds and inventor of Linux. He's a brilliant engineer and an unapologetic bad person who abuses people in public and has been causing a lot of harm to many people. He has been called out for his behavior for decades. And when recently questioned about the lack of diversity in tech, his response was basically, I don't care. And this behavior is widespread and widely accepted. Right now, you can be an abusive, bad person as much as you want, as long as you contribute technical things. This way, we end up normalizing harassment in our communities. In our communities these days, people don't see an issue with the fact that 90 to 99% of contributors are men. In our communities, we don't help the best ideas when but the best ideas from people with a high level of tolerance for personal abuse from community leaders. We need to identify and actively stamp out harmful and dangerous abusive behavior. This needs to be the responsibility of all of us. This is the responsibility we take on as members of a community. Silencing is a tactic that literally lets people, their work and voices disappear. Silencing aims to maintain the dominant class. It's generally used by a person with privilege against a person with less power to dismiss voices of dissent against the privileged majority speak. And it's a quite common pattern to observe in tech. Silencing tactics can be explicit and implicit. Amongst them are lawsuits filed, verbal threats to safety or professional livelihood, punishment, tone arguments, and many more. Woman. Even though the magic community has made progress in recent years, there are still problems with sexism and stores that aren't friendly to women. But as players, we can make a big difference by letting people know what's not okay and calling out questionable behavior. Man. Geez, can't I just have fun playing a game without having to deal with these social issues? Woman, that's the same thing I'm asking for. Textile is a space where people have to be afraid of consequences when either reporting or speaking up. Harder still, many people dismiss reports of harassment, sexism, discrimination and more as non-productive and outside their job description. They say things like, while you're complaining, I'll be over here programming. It's a luxury to be able to say that. It's a privilege to be in a pos position where you can just ignore all those issues and just not care. If marginalized people continue to be the only voices who are calling out bad behavior and incidents, they'll continue to be punished for it. They need people to stand up and stand with them. Systems reinforce the stereotypes and unconscious biases of the people who are designing them. The system we design always contains parts of ourselves. They're a representation of our very own capabilities and limitations. In the worst case, everything we design stays in a very narrow, self-referential mode. Thus, diversity is essential to good design and engineering on a very fundamental level. The privilege and the lack of diversity in tech have led to inadequate, insufficient, and very often inexistent tech solutions to women's, queers, and trans people's problems, basically to the problems of everyone who is not a man. This imbalance is even worse for people who face oppression at more than one level. Design processes are, of systems are problem-solving processes. When we're building software, we build it for users. Thus, 
Building software is an act of representation. And this representation means responsibility. The tech industry is still dominated by white, cis heterosexual, able bodied men with a ton of privilege. These are the people who have built our infrastructure. And when push comes to shove, these systems protect the people who designed them for their own use, while everyone else is constantly placed at risk. There's a huge difference in the online experiences of men and other groups. Online users who appear to be women are 25 times more likely to receive threats and sexually explicit messages than online users who appear to be men. And it's even worse for people who face harassment at multi multiple layers, for example, women of color. Sudet, an African-American woman, once used a photo of a white man in her profile picture, and the harassing and racist tweets she usually received virtually stopped. She said, as a white man, that was the most fun I had online in terms of actually getting to talk to people and not be insulted by them. I received fewer slurs and people were a lot more interested in my thought process than when I was anything else. Last summer, Gamergate took off, a sustained coordinated harassment campaign that seeks to drive women out of computing. The harassment these women still face included spreading their private information and home addresses, threats of rape and death, including a threat of a mass shooting at a speaking event. Gamergate, like all harassment, comes with a cost. It comes with higher levels of stress, emotional disturbance, it drives people out of their homes, keeps them from publicly speaking, and it burns their lives to the ground. Game developer and company co-founder Brianna Wu recently wrote about her reality these days. This circus has sucked every bit of joy from a career I once felt destined for. My capacity to feel fear has worn out, as if it's a muscle that can do no more. During the reign of terror of Gamergate, I have had hundreds of conversations with other women. We're exhausted. We're terrified we'll be next. We're all thinking of quitting. As a friend recently told me, it's a very dangerous time to be a woman with an opinion. What can be done about all these issues? Jacqueline Friedman, founder and executive director of Women Action Media said, if Silicon Valley can invent a driverless car, they can address online harassment on their platforms. They don't lack the talent, resources or vision to solve this problem. They lack the motivation. The ways that social media platforms are built even enable harassment and abuse. When money is on the line, like in cases around copyright violations, companies magically find ways to remove content and block repeated offenders. We need more egalitarian and empathetic system architectures. We need political changes in this industry, and we need to address our structural issues. And it's our own communities that are broken, and each and every one of us, especially the ones with more privilege and power, need to help fix them. There are various organizations and individuals who work on improving the culture in our tech industry. The largest number of them is run and supported by mostly marginalized people again. By now, marginalized people not only have to personally fight a battle for a right to exist in this industry, they are also pressured into doing it for others, while most diversity work still goes underpaid or completely unpaid. And the time they spend on fighting their own battles and those of others is time which they can't spend honing their skills. Diversity in efforts are initiatives to correct systemic inequalities, and they need everyone's support. As Adia Richards recently put it, diversity issues cannot be solved in the vacuum of privilege. Our diversity work needs to include women as well as queer, transsexual, intersexual people and people of other genders. And it needs to be aware of people who face multi-layered harassment as well. Our diversity work needs to be inclusive. Software increasingly defines the world around us. It's rewriting everything about human interaction. And it's systems built by men for men. 
with disastrous, dangerous consequences for all other underrepresented groups, which still don't truly have a seat at the table. System justification theory says that those in power will fight to defend the status quo, no matter what. This is what we're observing these days. And we also see masses of people like women, minorities and LGBT, LGBTQ people of all kinds. We see them speaking up about no longer being second class citizens in tech and geek culture. And the question we're fighting about here is, who gets to be the ones to shape the future? All we've looked at in this talk are powerful mechanisms that affect people's daily lives and our entire industry. What we've seen is about structural inequality, structural oppression, and entire industry, communities, and individuals causing harm to one another. What we've seen is about the question who we all want to be and how we want to move on. If we're not speaking out, we're complicit to this existing culture where the experiences of minorities are systematically denied, erased, and invalidated. We all play a role in setting the standards for the communities that we're part of. Thus, every one of us needs to examine our privilege and use it for good. Each of us needs to figure out what we can do to remove some of the burden that minorities in tech have to carry. We need to educate ourselves about the oppressions people face. We need to work on our empathy to become overall better humans and raise our own awareness towards what's really going on in this industry. We need to stop silencing people, stop shipping culture, and stop worshipping meritocracy. We need to recognize the limitations we create for users in our code and fulfill our representation role properly when building software. We need to fund efforts to increase diversity by giving money to individuals and organizations that do this work. We, and especially those of us in positions of influence, need to publicly and actively stand against the nastiness that is inherent with our culture. We need to acknowledge that this is everybody's work. And the more privileged we are, the more it is our responsibility to contribute to it. What we need now are deep changes, and they'll mean that our industry is not the same anymore. And that's a very good thing to go for. Together, we can change this industry and build a better future for it. Slowly, more women, lesbian, queer, gay, intersexual, transsexual, bisexual people, and people of color will be hired in tech. Slowly, the harmful structures of our existing culture will be examined. Slowly, our industry will become more inclusive. Slowly, we'll move to new professional standards. And slowly, we'll move towards the future. This future we're talking about is about justice. It's about an industry without violence, discrimination, exclusiveness, and abusiveness. This future we're talking about is, about, is bright and great. And if we all join these who are already working on it, it will soon be visible for all of us. Have you ever looked at the stars at night? Have you ever felt that there might be something beyond them, something you cannot see with your own eyes? More than 40 years ago, Freddie Mercury wrote, nothing really matters, anyone can see. Nothing really matters, nothing really matters to me. We need to open our minds, broaden our horizons, and widen our communities to fully understand what really matters. All of us need to work on making this industry a place for everyone, because nothing really matters. Thank you. Thank you.